came to celebrate life to um, to develop my healing abilities and I had no idea all of the things that would come after my first experience at celebrate life and I got ordained and became a, a national spiritualist teacher and then COVID hit and I found myself having to teach college online and everything went online and, and suddenly I found myself drawn back to celebrate life where we were doing things virtually rather than in person and one thing led to another and yes I'm very happy to be back with you all today and every day. <laughs> so the month of August, in, in spiritualism we have uh, several days of observance uh, depending on what month it is um, various things like the Fox sisters and the first uh, connection with spirit uh, in March and in August we celebrate two days uh, the first one is spiritual science day and the second one is Andrew Jackson's birthday so the first spiritual science day reminds us that we are an expression of spirit Everything in the physical world is an expression of spirit. And what's interesting is that this has been confirmed by quantum physics. Esteemed physicists like Max Planck and David Bohm have provided scientific evidence that matter is not primary. Matter doesn't come first. The mind produces the matter. And when science unites with spirituality, we are able to more fully comprehend the many human experiences that are referred to as paranormal. So the second holiday, not really a holiday, but the second day we observe is Andrew Jackson's Davis's birthday. Uh, the America's first seer who was born in Poughkeepsie, New York on August 11th, 1826. Davis was one of the first prolific authors in the field of spiritualism, and his writings open up a new perspective on a variety of topics such as what happens to the soul at death, the phenomena of spiritualism, education, health, psychology, philosophy, and government. And while he probably didn't know it at the time, he is recognized as a hermeticist, someone who spoke about the hermetic sciences, but at the time, he was uneducated. He, I, I'm bringing this up because he was channeling a general information that's in the universe, that's in the Akasha, that was at the right time and the right place, upstate New York in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. So it's amazing how the same ideas come through different people when the time is right. So a little bit about uh, Davis's background. Uh, oftentimes we, we just go through the uh, step by step, he was born here, this happened to him there, that he uh, disappeared for um, an evening and ended up 40 miles away from his house, all those sorts of things. But I want to drill into um, one of his books. I'm just going to touch lightly on his background. Um, Davis was a simple Hudson Valley farm boy, born into a poor, illiterate family, and at the age of 17, a local tailor put him into a trance using a technique picked up from a traveling mesmerist. Now, mesmerism comes from Mesmer, the gentleman who developed the theory of animal magnetism, and a mesmeric pass is just passing hands over the person very slowly, over and over, until the person drops into a trance. And so the first time that happened to Davis, he, he, nothing happened to him when he saw the traveling mesmerist, but his local tailor wanted to learn how to do it. So he practiced on Andrew Jackson Davis and he dropped right into trance. After that, he started experiencing many spiritual visions and found himself transformed from a shoemaker's apprentice fresh off the farm to the forerunner of American alternative spirituality. Davis was the perfect example of a modern prophet, not from the biblical lands in the Middle East, but from an American industrial city in the heart of the Hudson River Valley. He inspired keen interest in the emerging alternative spirituality movement with his remarkable ability to create metaphysical lectures out of what he experienced in his trance states. His life and teachings were extremely popular, being discussed in newspapers, pamphlets, books, and lectures, and the name Poughkeepsie was never so widely heard. Davis soon became known as the Poughkeepsie Seer, and one of the earliest, most popular figures to talk about heaven as a place that was populated by all the world's people, from every religion and every walk of life. He wanted us to know that our spiritual search didn't depend on ancient books, 
cathedrals or traditional institutes of learning, and that people could search for God in ordinary places in their lives, in their barn, at their kitchen table, by their stove or in their workshops. Clearly, we can't predict where the world's next visionary will appear. Who knew, more than 50 years before the sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce, Edgar Cayce, the most radical, impactful spiritual voice of the 19th century would be found sitting at a shoemaker's bench in the industrial town of Poughkeepsie. But there he was. So now, this is what I really wanna share with you today, is I want us to take a quick look at the extensive collection of his thoughts on spiritual science entitled the harmonial philosophy. So the harmonial philosophy is his, he would go into trance and download this information and he had a scribe. And then a few years later, uh, someone compiled it all. And I want to take a moment here to actually show you the source online so that you can go and read the harmonial philosophy. It's just amazing. Let's see, here we go. Share sound. I say this because as I uh, continue being a minister and a teacher, I'm finding out I'm more of a teacher rather than a preacher. So I like to show people where I get my information so that they can continue to study themselves. You know, spiritualism is not a religion of dogma. It's a religion of information and knowledge and thinking about what's right for us, finding our own truths. And there's so much information provided by the early spiritualists that are, it's still valid today. So here is, this is Internet Archive, and I'll share the link later. But here's his book in PDF form. You can search inside, you can search here for names, words, if you want to uh, get uh, information on a specific topic in this book. You can download it as a PDF. And uh, let's see, down here, I'm gonna move this little thing here. And also you have the option of, here's the thumbnails. You can look at it page by page. And let's quickly, I want to show you this page here, and we can make it bigger. So this is the front page, you know, the, uh, the page inside the cover of the book. So this is the Harmonial Philosophy, a compendium and digest of the works of Andrew Jackson Davis, the seer of Poughkeepsie. And it was edited, and the preface and biological summary were written by a doctor of hermetic science who doesn't seem to name himself. But this is where hermeticism gets tied in with Andrew Jackson Davis. And I want to share with you how his book has been organized into, I don't mean to make you guys seasick here, but his book, this book, The Harmonial Philosophy, has been organized into eight books. And I, I want to share this with you to pique your interest because each one of these little sections is not that long and you can digest a piece of what he's brought to us to share. It's very easy reading actually considering it was written in 1847. So the first book is Revelation of Divine Being. He talks about God. Second book is The Principles of Nature. And this is where he was said to have discovered or predicted the ninth planet, uh, Pluto. Very, each one of these is absolutely fascinating. The primitive history of man from psychic sources. Here he talks about the revelations of mind and soul, the outward and the inward, seven mental states, mind as a motive and moral power. So this is where he developed his idea about, now we talk about mental mediumship and physical mediumship. Well, he was the first one to start, divine, start defining the states of mind of mankind and how we can use those states to get information from spirit. Goes on to have book four, Death and the Afterlife. Absolutely fascinating. Just th This is where the ideas that come from Andrew Jackson Davis are written. So you can find the original source and draw your own conclusions. Religion and Theology, Revelations of Harmonial Life. And it goes, he gets into natural law here, health and disease, 
And uh, the last part here, um, philosophy of spiritual intercourse, you know, discussion with spirit, inter interacting with spirit. And on the last page, he gets into the philosophy and spiritualism, religious value of spiritualism, and his last words on the harmonial philosophy. So he was inspired as an uneducated farm boy in Poughkeepsie, New York, to talk about things he wasn't even aware of when he wasn't in a trance state. So he was learning from himself as he went into these trance states uh, about the nature of the universe and he was compelled to share them. So like I said, I will share the um, link with that book later. It will read to you. You can search it, you can copy paste, and you can download it if you want. And I find it absolutely fascinating. I'm just pick a chapter and, and dig right into it. Um, so anyway, that's uh, the harmonial philosophy. So today I want to dive a little bit more deeply into a sample of his writings from book four, Death and the Afterlife, which encourages us to embrace the change called death. So Davis tells us that death is but a door leading to another room and a house not made with hands. One of the most persistent questions humans have ever asked is, what is the meaning of death? All major religions believe in life after death, but some societies have a negative outlook on death like ours and see it as a failure. You know, doctors put so much effort into heroic measures to prolong life, but it's like when someone dies, it's considered a failure. But in other societies, they have, they have a positive outlook like the Tibetans, the Indians, and indigenous people in general. They see death as something to be celebrated as a natural process and an opportunity for growth. And religion provides the framework. So the religion of spiritualism views death as a natural process rather than something to be feared. And knowledge received from the spirit side of life helps us to understand people's attitudes towards death and dying so that we as spiritualists may be better of service to someone who's facing the inevitability of the change called death, be it their own or that of a loved one. And spiritualism's belief that we can communicate with those in spirit give us a unique perspective on death's relationship to life and what happens to a soul once it's no longer in the physical realm. So think about it. If we deny the inevitability of death by ignoring or hiding it, this creates fear. Fear arises out of the unknown. But if we are raised in an environment where the terminally ill and elderly people are cared for by friends and family, whether at home or in a facility, and we are encouraged to participate in the preparation for burial once they're transitioning, once they've transitioned, fear of the unknown is replaced with the familiarity and appreciation of this natural process. So we have to face the things that we're afraid of and then suddenly the fear drops away because we understand it. So if we think about death as an opportunity for our souls to evolve, this leads to an appreciation of that stage rather than seeing it as something to fear. And when we embrace the change called death as a natural part of life, merely a transition to our soul, a transition for our soul from one phase of development to the next, we are inspired to discover and fulfill our purpose in this lifetime. However, this is much easier said than done to, when we have to face our own physical death. I mean, it's easy to talk about when, when we're actually terminally ill, it's a whole nother story. But practicing, practice does not make perfect, but practicing meaning becoming familiar with the various stages of life, doing hospice work, being around people who are having, who are faced with illness rather than hiding away from them because it scares you. It helps us to better understand and appreciate the lessons we learn from each stage of life. Change requires that we lose something in order to gain something else. When we learn that physical existence, whether ours or someone else's will be ending due to a terminal illness, it is a natural function to grieve that loss, regardless of what we may gain in its place. And when we understand the stages of grief, now Elizabeth Kubler-Ross defined them as five, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. 
So these stages help us process loss and see our grieving process as something natural. And when we can learn to accept loss, it it's, uh, makes life a lot easier. And learning to accept loss is made easier by the vast knowledge of the afterlife revealed by seers such as Andrew Jackson Davis. This information opens the door to new possibilities and attitudes that we could not otherwise have when our focus is on attachments to life on the earth plane. So in my experience, I'm in my 60s now, as I'm growing older, Davis's view that dying is a slow, steady process really resonates with me. And his words about dying starting in midlife rather than suddenly happening at the end of our life, as the soul gradually prepares to move on to higher spheres of consciousness, as I live it, I can feel it. And I'm talking about spirituality. When I was younger, that was the last thing on my mind. So it, his processes and his steps really do make sense to me. So Davis had this to say about dying. The philosophy of death is the philosophy of change. It is not, however, change of the personality of the individual, but rather of your state, your situation only, meaning that the personality first resides in an earthly body, then exchanges that for a spiritual body, better suited for life on the higher planes or spheres of existence. According to Davis, as soon as we are fully mature, the spirit exercises its full control over us in a process of transformation and it begins at midlife. The change is imperceptible at first, yet it progresses slowly but surely. The physical body doesn't die over a span of a few hours, but over many years, during which time the soul gradually releases its hold on the physical form and begins to focus on moving towards higher spheres or planes of existence. So Davis has de defined the five stages of soul development. So the first one is childhood. So the unique aspects of the personality and interest begin to develop in a small child. And the second stage is the teenage years where the personality becomes more established, conforming more to the world around them while emotionally and spiritually still immature. The third uh, stage he defines is adulthood, where spiritual and emotional maturity are displayed in our personalities and interests. And it is in this stage that the process of dying or transformation begins. This is, there's a stirring of the soul. I mean, it's imperceptible, but it's, it's noticeable. Kind of uh, didn't make sense, but it, it's like you don't notice it, but you notice it if you start to pay attention. There's a stirring in our soul, like a quickening, a yearning towards a time when it is no longer bound by the physical body to reunite with those who reside in the spirit side of life. And his fourth stage is old age, which I'm entering now. The physical body gradually begins to lose its ability to function. Little by little, the soul withdraws from the physical form. And the soul, by degrees, spends more time in the world of spirit and the inner life. And I know that to be true for myself because I wake up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning and I just stay still in bed and, and think and, and bond with spirit. And I get the most amazing downloads at that quiet time of night. And I realize that that's my soul spending more time on the other side in preparation for the time when I spend all my time on the other side. So it's... Each stage of life has a purpose, and one is not better than the other. They're all a series that helps our soul grow and develop. And the fifth and final stage that Davis has defined is the chemistry of actual death. Bit by bit, the body functions shut down, the last breath is exhaled, and the soul transitions to a higher spiritual plane. To quote Davis again, a blessed atmosphere fills the room of the dearly departed, propelling the soul to a summer land beyond the stars. So we can see that death is a birth into a new and more perfect existence. 
Davis witnessed many transitions here, uh, many transitions. And here I'm going to share one of his many accounts of how the soul leaves the body. And this is from 1847. So a human being lies on the deathbed and is indeed actually dying. It is to be a rapid death. The physical body grows cold as the elements of the spiritual body become warm. The feet become cold first, and the clairvoyant sees what appears to be a golden ethereal halo over the head, pulsing with consciousness. The body grows cold as the life force slowly leaves, and the halo expands and begins to rise towards the ceiling. Now, quickly, I want to show you, and let me see how I'm doing for time here. Okay, I'm good. I want to share with you an image that I found that depicts that. Just as he said, it's called the, can't see here. It's called uh, the death scene. So just as he's depicting it, people are gathered around the person. The person is getting ready to transition into spirit. And here's the ethereal body uh, uh, forming in the halo that's above the head. I just think this is fascinating because it really gives me an impression of, you know, what he could see as a clairvoyant, he could actually see this happening. And he spent many years of his life observing the change called death. So anyway, back to our story here. So as you saw in the picture, the person ceases to breathe and the pulse grows still. The halo, now more like an emanation, begins to become elongated and turns into the outline of a human form, but is still connected to the physical brain by a fine life thread. Thinking continues while all physical parts of the person are lifeless. On the body of the emanation, there appears something white and shining, like a human head. Next comes a faint outline of the face, then the neck and the shoulders manifest, and then in rapid succession, all parts of the new body down to the feet a bright shining image, something somewhat smaller than the physical, but a perfect prototype except for any disfigurement that the person may have had. The fine life thread continues to be attached to the physical brain. And when the thread withdraws, the spiritual body is prepared, free to go to Summerland accompanied by its spiritual guardians who have assembled for that journey. In closing, friends, I encourage you all to embrace the change called death. I know that my innate drive to understand and develop spiritually is an intuitive preparation for a smooth transition to the spiritual realm. Over the last few years, I, I felt a change of attitude in myself. I, I can sense the voice of spirit slowly but steadily replacing the voice of my ego. And it's, it's just so calm and peaceful compared to when I was younger. And I find myself compelled to be of service to others by doing hospice work and providing grief counseling for friends and family who have lost their loved ones. This helps me become familiar with and less fearful of the natural thoughts and emotions that accompany the grief process. I guess you could call it a dress rehearsal for my own time of transition. And while this may sound a little bit strange, I see death like sitting in your car while it goes to a car wash. Your awareness remains the same as your exterior gets all purified, coming out on the other side, all clean and shiny. Thank you for allowing me to serve spirit today.